Hey, this is Navina. It's still on the uh, Run It Up From Nothing series. Um, I've kind of been getting into these uh, sit and go tournaments a lot more. Not because I particularly enjoy them. Uh, I definitely prefer Heads Up, but just looking at my hold'em manager and looking at uh, where the money's coming from, there's no doubt that uh, if it weren't for the sit and goes, I would be uh, not doing nearly as well. I mean, I'm crushing these, honestly. And I think um, I like these turbo, like the super turbo sit and goes, because if you know a little bit about um, strategy at different levels, like different stack sizes, you're probably going to have a pretty big edge on a field of players uh, playing these low star micro stakes super turbos. Because probably a lot of these players have uh, not played like a lot of heads up or not played a lot of like, you know, 15 big blind stack depth. Uh, and you should have a pretty good edge on bad players in the early goings. Um, so it just, I guess the more you know about uh, how to play each different stack size, the better you're probably going to fare in this format because the blinds go up super, super fast. So if a player is like coming on and playing one of these for the first time, second time, which you're going to find some of that at like a $5 level, um, they're really not going to know probably what they're doing. Whereas if you've played just a ton of uh, sit and goes over the years, and you found yourself in uh, all of these spots, you know, having to play a 20 big blind stack on the bubble when everybody else has, you know, 100 big blind, you know, just different. The more, I guess, the more particular circumstances that you feel comfortable in, and the better your understanding of ICM, like independent chip modeling, uh, the better you're going to fare. Um, I, I think it's probably noteworthy that this guy limped. Well, it's clearly noteworthy that he opened up Dace Queen. Um, uh, but he also checked it out, which I think is also noteworthy. Uh, noteworthy. <clears throat> and right now, we don't know whether that means that uh, he understands showdown value. He thought that. Uh, he wasn't going to get enough folds from better hands and uh, wasn't going to get any calls from worse hands or if he simply won't bet an ace-queen on improved. But for right now, we'll just know it is that. One thing I know is uh, when I try to commentate while I'm playing, I don't do as well. And uh, I'm not trying to use that as an excuse exactly, but... Uh, it is true because I'm not in the game as much. I mean, I should be in the game more because I'm trying to talk about the game. But when you really just zone out and get into it and you're taking notes and you know what guys you can block and what guys you can value town, uh, what guys are going to bluff up all their chips to you, that's when, that's when you really are playing the game. So I'm going to try to pay a little bit of attention. I'm already lost in this hand, so <clears throat> it's not going to do any good to start now, but... Maybe we'll get some interesting information. I don't know. All I know right now is that uh, seat nine, that, and eight called on the time. Hmm. And he limped ace king, right? Pretty sure. Pretty sure. If you're not familiar with my noting system, the blue just means like a passive calling station type player. I think we've got a pretty obvious and trivial open raise of pocket nines, pretty much dependent or regardless of who we're playing against. But I mean, especially against players that we kind of want to flop around with, we that probably aren't gonna just kill us on um, on position. They're not gonna just like make life hell for us because we're playing out of position. I will glide, uh, loosen up a little bit from under the gun. Not that that was extremely loose, but um, I would open raise uh, probably all my pocket pairs in this setting. We don't have a lot of three betting going on, and again, I don't really feel like I'm going to be owned when I have to take a flop out of position. I feel like I'm going to be able to take a hand like uh, that, that's a set mine essentially, and I'm going to be able to. You know, build a pot out of position by check racing the right streets at the right times, and uh, also have the opportunity to realize my showdown value that's built into pocket pairs 
a lot more often with players that are not real, real aggressive. And I know this game just started, but it's pretty clear to me right now that we're not playing against like a bunch of Gus Hansons. Gus Hanson, there's a, a throwback, but you know, I mean, really, we're not. <laughs> we're not. Um, my basic rule of thumb here is we clearly don't love to, to just bluff randomly into three opponents, but especially if we're going to bluff some of the time and we're not going to bluff other times, then uh, it doesn't make sense to bluff when we don't have any hope of winning if we're called. So like if this was a, uh, say a jack, and we had like uh, a di nine of diamonds, then it might make a little bit more sense. I'm still not betting that particular hand in the... Uh, but if you need, if you think you're in a spot where you might want to bluff, check your equity. See if you've got like uh, a, a lot of cards that you can fire a second barrel against. If you get, say, like a reluctant one call, like one player folds and the player kind of tanks and then calls, are are you going to have a lot of cards that can come out and improve your equity enough to make you want to fire another shell? And just for example, if we did have like the nine of diamonds with the jack here, we definitely would have bet this card, and then we would have kind of got there. At least we'd have some pretty decent showdown value at this point. Not at that point, but you know. <laughs> See, I kind of wish I would have paid attention to how that played out, you know. Um, I'm pretty sure there was a king-queen that didn't open raise and an ace-five suited that also just completed. So this is shaping up to be probably the fishiest table that I've ever played at. I mean, seriously, like, it can't get any more fishy, right? <laughs> Have we seen any pre-flop raise? Well, okay. saw one pre-flop raise just now. So what kind of, uh, well, there's the raise, there's the ship. Um, I'm just going to make a note that he three bet shipped it. With ace nine. Wow. Well, I'm not going to make a note because he's going to be bust over it. Yeah. So maybe player 9 is shaping up to be a bit of a tag, like a tight aggressive player. I'll plan on seeing him heads up probably. Um, yeah, I think we'll go ahead and uh, call here and see if we can't just flop a set. Double up. Hey, hey, hey. part A has been accomplished. Part E of our, or part A of our flop set double up plan has been accomplished. If he calls, it's going to be like, oh, that's fantastic. So what we're going to do here is just put in enough of a raise that we can get stacks in comfortably. Um, and if we get like called and called here, we can definitely, uh, even here though, we can just go ahead and ship the turn. Just pray that he's got a, uh, but we don't have to ship the turn. We're in position. I think we'll check it back. Act like we're afraid of that six. Okay, maybe if he's got a jack, he check calls it off now. And that might have allowed him to get away from the jack if I would have uh, bombed the turn. And if, you know, that's the positional advantage. Um, being able to go ahead and just check back the turn. Because I don't have to worry about missing anything. If I'm out of position, if I check and you know it goes check check, then what am I? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like I don't have to worry so much about losing a street of value, and especially the way I set the stacks. Um, the raise sizing that I made on the flop, I think was the, uh, I think it was a good example of how you should be thinking. And I was actually thinking it was sort of a mistake in my brain, uh, and it just accidentally worked out. I was thinking the way I sized my bet is if I got call call, then I could ship the turn easily. Uh, but actually just getting the one call it would have allowed me to ship the turn easily. The way it ran out though, I thought that if I checked back, then either player, this player here, was either going to probably have a hand, well, when it goes check, check, on the turn, when the river comes out, he's almost certainly going to have a hand that he either decides to jam himself either for value or as a bluff on the river, in which case I just pick it off and stack him, or he's going to have a hand that checks to call, not checks to fold very unlikely that in that scenario he's going to check call the flop or bet call I raise and he's going to call a raise on the flop and then when it goes check check on the turn 
he's probably almost never going to just give up. He's never just going to like check, fold the river. So I think I played that pretty well, starting with an accidentally well-sized bet. 